Welcome to a new Carter Report series, The Game Changers. These rare individuals appear once in a lifetime, like a blazing meteor across the night sky. They change the course of history. They show us the way forward. Welcome to The Game Changers. Uh, welcome back. Today we're talking about the greatest game changer of them all. The person who has changed the world more than any other single individual. Um, I want you to think at this stage now, and this is a follow on from the last program. I want you to think of his teachings. I went to the Soviet Union for the first time in the year 1971. I was at Moscow airport. And as I was standing there, a communist official came up to me and started to interrogate me just a little bit. And he started to deride Christianity, saying, you know, like Khrushchev said, it's all going to be gone soon. We're just going to take over the world and blah, blah, blah. I, I said to him, do you know what Jesus taught? Now, usually if you talk to an atheist and say, do you know what Jesus taught? You know what he's going to do, don't you? He's just going to give you the blank look. He's going to say, oh, no, but uh, they, they, all those people carried out the Inquisition. No, no, that had nothing to do with Jesus. So don't give me that stuff. Do you know what Jesus taught? Well, I said, well, he said, no, I, I, I really don't. I said, I've got a Bible that I'm carrying around the world. This is my own personal Bible. I really don't want to lose it. But I think maybe you need it more than I do. So I gave him my Bible and I said, let us together do something. I want you to come over here to Matthew 5 and verses 43 and 44 and notice what this Jewish carpenter said. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43 and 44. This is one of the most extraordinary, one of the most revolutionary teachings in the history of the world. Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Goodness, how many people really do that who call themselves Christians? Jesus said, you got to love your enemies. You know the man who lost his daughter at the hands of the Irish Republican Army in Ireland? That's where the Catholics and the Protestants fought and killed each other for the love of God. And so this beautiful girl is dying in her father's arms, murdered by the IRA. Her last words, Daddy... I love you. After the funeral, he sought so hard to have a meeting with the leaders of this infamous gang of murderers. After a long time, he was able to meet them. They thought it, perhaps he'd, he'd, he'd want to kill them. But he said, I've come with one message. I'm a follower of Christ and I forgive you. That's something they couldn't understand. He said, haven't we killed enough in this country of Ireland? Isn't it time for Catholics and Protestants to follow the teachings of Christ and love one another? This was the end of the violence in Northern Ireland. The man who said, I forgive you. You know the biggest problem today in the Middle East? You know why they can't get peace between the Jews and the Arabs? Every president thinks he's going to do it, but the problem is every president is fighting against human nature because human nature hates. But Jesus said, love your enemies. The Middle East will never have peace until they accept the Prince of Peace who taught us to love our enemies. 
a bitter pill uh, for the so-called Christian to believe. You've heard of the born fools in Russia where the communists were militant atheists and tortured and beat people to death. That's what atheism does. That's what communism does. And there were a group of Baptists there and they would see the communists and the atheists beating other communists and atheists and they would be screaming and blaspheming. And the Baptist said, don't beat the atheists, beat us. When you beat them, more hate will go into the world. But when you beat us, we will send love into the world. So they did. Do you know what the atheists call them? Born fools. They said uh, they've got to be born fools. But I want you to know that the greatest force in the world is not military might, which has failed us completely, but it is love. On one occasion, the Pharisees sent men to arrest Jesus, but they came back empty-handed. They couldn't bring him back. And uh, they said to those men, where is the man we told you to arrest? And they said, Never man spoke like this man. His teachings are totally extraordinary. Hardly known or believed uh, by people who call themselves his followers, let alone uh, the atheists. But I have reserved for the last the greatest reason why he is the greatest game changer and why he is so extraordinary and so amazing. We are born to live. Every baby that is born is born to live. But he was not born to live. His destiny was to die. If you turn to Acts chapter 4, verse 27 and 28, these are profound, uh, almost overwhelming thoughts. Acts chapter 4, 27 and uh, 28, for truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand, wait for it, and your purpose determined before to be done. This teaches the sovereignty of God and that Jesus was the child of destiny. He was born to die. I want you to notice, and we're going to go through this, not with any great exegesis because we don't have the time, but I want you to notice ancient predictions about this child of destiny. The place of his birth was predicted. His parents came from a little town by the name of Nazareth. But they had to go down to a town by the name of Bethlehem. Jesus could have been born anywhere except the prophecy said that he would be born in Bethlehem. And you can read it in the Jewish Old Testament in the book of Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. The text says, but you Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are so little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Look at these words. Whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. He was the one from billions of years ago. It was predicted he would not be born in Nazareth, but in Bethlehem. The miracle of his birth was predicted. Isaiah chapter 7 and uh, verse 14, it was predicted. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Mary was engaged to a good man by the name of Joseph. And before the marriage, it was discovered she was pregnant. He was going to put her away. But an angel came down and said, don't be worried about this 
beautiful little girl because that which is conceived uh, in her womb is of God. People say, can't believe in the virgin birth. It's an absolute impossibility. (laughs) How much do you know? How much do you know? Don't you realize that the God who made the stars uh, can do anything? Nothing is too hard. It was predicted that he would live in Egypt. Hosea chapter 11 and verse 1 says, When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I call my son. The Bible tells us that Herod the Great tried to kill him. And therefore, Joseph and Mary took the little baby and took him down here to the land of the pharaohs. It was predicted. It was written down. The year of his baptism and death was predicted. This is so complex, I'm not going to try to prove it to you. It was predicted that there'd be a period of 483 years that would come after the decree of Artaxerxes Longjamanus in 457, and this brings you through to the year 27 AD. And that was the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, and that was the year, that was the time when Jesus appeared to the children of Israel. This was the year when John the Baptist baptized him. It was the time when Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Three and a half years later, in the midst of the final prophetic week, in 31 AD, the Messiah was cut off and murdered. It was predicted. Let me share quickly the prophecy with you. Daniel chapter 9, 25 to 27. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem, 457, until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, 483 days, 483 years. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. He'd be murdered. And the people of the prince, the Romans, who is to come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary that happened in 70 AD. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, the last week. And in the middle of the week, 31 AD, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. There's only one thing that could bring an end to all the Jewish sacrifices in their old temple, and that was the sacrifice of the Lamb of God himself. Astounding. Astounding. I do not believe uh, because of blind faith. I believe in Christ because uh, of overwhelming evidence. Lived on time, uh, preached on time, uh, was baptized on time, died on time. It was predicted he'd be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41 verse 9 says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, Judas, who are, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. He was betrayed by one of his closest friends. It was predicted. The price of his betrayal was predicted. 30 lousy pieces of silver. Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 13. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter. That princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. The priests gave Judas 30 dirty pieces of silver to buy Christ. How many people have sold Christ for money and political power and to win the votes? And after the die was cast and Christ was arrested, Judas took the 30 dirty pieces of silver blood money and went into the Jewish temple and threw it to the priests 
They said, your blood be on your own head. See us. Taught yourselves. Judas went out and hanged himself, and the Jewish leaders bought the potter's field. It was written down thousands, hundreds of years before he was born. He was a child uh, of destiny, not like anybody else, not like you and me. The manner of his death was predicted by crucifixion. Psalm 22 and verse 16. The dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Crucifixion. Written, these words written 1000 BC. Crucifixion was not known. It was predicted that the Jewish Messiah, Yahweh Elohim, God in human flesh, would be crucified the worst type of death. Who was this person hanging on the cross? Not a Jewish renegade, not a heretic. This was the creator of the universe come down to save us. People today are mesmerized by every little news flash. Breaking news. Who cares? It's dead in one second. It's trivia. It's humbug. Most of it. It was predicted that God would be manifested in human flesh and die for the world. The greatest truth in the history of the world, not politics, none of this stuff. It'll all be gone soon. But the truth of Christ, the greatest game changer, it was predicted that none of his bones would be broken. Psalm 22, 17 and 18. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. They did. For my clothing, they cast lots. They did. Jesus was put on the cross at nine in the morning. He was dead at three in the afternoon. Remarkable. Man could live on the cross for a week. He was dead in six hours. Why? Because of the sin of the world. So they came before the Sabbath to break the legs of the criminals. They were going to take them down, lie them at the foot of the cross and put them up on Saturday evening because they could live for another few days. But when they came to Christ, his bones were not broken because he was dead. Because uh, it was written. It is predicted that his death would be for sinners, his burial in a rich man's tomb. Isaiah 53 and verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked in the midst of two thieves. But with the rich at his death, buried in a rich man's tomb, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Buried in a rich man's tomb. It was also predicted that the grave could not hold him. In Psalm 16 and verse 10, written a thousand years before he was born, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One uh, to see corruption. He was dead three on Friday. He was anointed, put in the tomb before the Sabbath. But on the Sunday morning, there was a mighty earthquake and Jesus, the creator of the universe, walked out of the tomb. Walked out of the tomb and said to the world uh, and the hosts of evil, I am the resurrection 
and the life. He is the greatest game changer because he's not dead, he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. Every baby boy, every baby girl, every baby is born to live. He was completely different. He was God in human flesh. Some people say, well, of course, it doesn't matter what you believe. It uh, doesn't matter what your religion is. That, of course, is very shallow thinking. It's really puerile. Either he is whom he claimed to be or else he's a crazy lunatic. But if he is whom he claimed to be, and this is why astronomy fascinates me and why I study it, the one who made the black holes and 400 billion galaxies, 400 billion, one who made all of these things slept for nine months in the womb of a peasant girl, completely apart from the priests and uh, the political establishment, and then went to the cross. Hanging on the cross was the gospel. One of the strangest texts is Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46. Now from the sixth hour, 12 o'clock, until the ninth hour, three o'clock, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is an extraordinary way to die. I do not want to die as Jesus died. Because he did not die as a saved soul. He died under the wrath of the broken law of God. And all of our sins were laid upon him. And he was punished in our place. And that is why he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Every person outside of Christ one day is going to say those words. In the second judgment, when people come up in their billions, they're going to cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But they don't need to because he bore the price of our sins. There may be some things that our dull, dumb minds can't comprehend, but I can understand a little bit John chapter 3 and verse 16. You know the words, John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world. <laughs> How big that he gave his only begotten son, the monogenes, the one and only, so that whoever believes in him should not or shall not perish but have everlasting life. So that's why he's the greatest game changer. That is why, as a Christian, I find it quite extraordinary to see Christians playing around in mud puddles and other people completely obsessed with politics. It's all going to be gone soon. It's all trivia. But Christ endures forever. We get caught up in other things because we really have ne never met him. Not only is he the greatest game changer in the history of the planet, the good news is he will change your life if you let him. If you let him, he will come into your life and he'll make you into a new person. And because of his grace, he will take you to be with him in paradise. That's his promise. And so we say, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. 
I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Many years ago, I heard this poem or this hymn because the Bible says he will come again and he comes again as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Look, ye saints, the sight is glorious. See the man of sorrows now from the fight returned victorious. Every knee to him shall bow. Crown him, crown him. Crown him, crown him. Crowns become the victor's brow. I present to you today, Jesus Christ, the greatest game changer of them all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. John Carter reports, We have seen God's power as the gospel of Christ has been proclaimed in Africa, India, Russia, Ukraine, Cuba, El Salvador, and many other places. We invite you to partner with us in proclaiming Jesus Christ. God be the glory. Great things he has done. Write today to the Carter Report, P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. That's the Carter Report, P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. In Australia, write to The Carter Report, P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. That's The Carter Report, P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. Thank you for your generous support. We look forward to hearing from you soon. May God richly bless you. copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.